join me all in giving a very, very warm welcome um, to our very distinguished speaker, our, our culmination of our um, uh, speaker series for this, uh, for this year, Mutar Kent. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, um, President Frank and Dean Quelch. Thank you. Um, it's always an honor and pleasure to um, come here to um, Miami, University of Miami. I was here um, about uh, eight, nine years ago, and it's a great, um, a wonderful um, experience that I had great memories of, and now I'm back. So wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Um, <laughs> As you might guess, I speak, um, I have spoken, and I continue to speak to many groups um, throughout my life. Um, but I want to say that this kind of audience is my, is my favorite. I get a lot of psychic income uh, meeting, uh, being with students and, and being around um, institutions of education. Um, today, what I'd like to do um, this evening is to offer you a peek uh, into what has been my life, the business of beverages, the business of Coca-Cola, uh, and also look at some key uh, trends um, we're seeing in the consumer goods area, in the beverage area, in the, and, and later I'll share a few thoughts on business leadership, and then um, after that, um, we hope to take the stage with my good friend Troy Taylor, who is, um, uh, the um, owner and, and the principal and, and the chairman of Coca-Cola Bottling uh, Company Florida, and, um, uh, and we'll take any questions and we'll have a mo uh, them moderated by Dean Quelch. Um, I started with Coca-Cola in 1978 on red trucks um, in Atlanta um, after um, um, answering a, a, a classified ads of the New York Times. There, were no there was no internet, there were no mobile phones. Um, and I started on red trucks in Atlanta, then moved on to Needham, Massachusetts, then Lubbock, Texas, and then ended up in Los Angeles, um, and then full circle back into Atlanta. Um, and then um, I worked on four continents. Um, there is no more international Coke company and international system than Coca-Cola. Um, and then um, I, full circle, um, I passed the keys of the red truck to my successor, uh, James Quincy, um, an Englishman who I have been, uh, who has been working with me for the last 20 years and uh, I have um, great confidence in and, and the management succession took place. Uh, um, some things don't really change. Um, we are still providing simple moments of delicious re refreshment and uplift, as we did 40 years ago. Uh, moments that actually bring people together, uh, moments that bring families together, friends together, neighbors together, colleagues together. That's what our business is, essentially. When I started um, back 41 years ago, uh, we were essentially a one product, one company, uh, one, one brand business. Little exaggeration there, we had a few other brands, but in essence. Today, we have more than 550 brands and 3,800 products and growing every day. When I started, we had never ever seen a fruit tree in our life at Coca-Cola. Today, um, we are the biggest grower of fruit trees in the world. Um, we uh, are the biggest uh, juice business in the world by far of any company. Uh, we have about uh, 35 million trees under plantation with our partners uh, from pomegranate in Asia, China, to mango in Asia and Africa, to citrus in the Americas, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, apple. Um, um, we planted recently, in the last five years, about 12 million stone fruit trees because there's a shortage in the world. Stone fruit, fruit means peach, apricot, um, uh, cherry, essentially, uh, those trees. 
And if you add up the, all of that up, about 30 million trees, it's about the size of Belgium. <laughs> Just to give you a perspective. Um, that's the kind of change I've seen. Today, our brands touch the lives of people in every nation on Earth, uh, save two. North Korea and Cuba. Um, when I started, we had a few more that, uh, and then we entered Myanmar and a few others, but now we, we're, we're not, not in those two countries. Other than that, we have operations in every country. We have um, more than about, um, 21, more than 20 billion dollar brands, brands like, uh, in other than Coca-Cola, brands like Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, Sprite, Fanta, Simply Orange, Vitamin Water, Costa, Dasani, just to mention a few. Uh, globally, um, uh, people reach for our drinks um, just under two billion times every day. Um, haven't quite got to two billion, but uh, when I started um, as, as CEO, it was 1.1 billion, and now it's about two billion almost. Um, they re reach for our uh, famous drinks, sparkling drinks, um, also for our waters, for juices, teas, coffees, sport drinks, value-added dairy, um, drinks like Fairlife, um, which is the fastest growing dairy products, uh, dairy brand in the United States. And ultimately, our goal is to provide th that delicious uh, uh, refreshment uplift for every occasion, every lifestyle, every kind of person, choice. And Robert uh, Woodruff, um, who led our business for more than half a century, um, wanted Coca-Cola always to be at an arm's reach of desire. Um, and that's the kind of idea behind that widespread um, uh, easy availability of our products. Because when your products are at an arm's reach of desire, then they are always at the risk of being purchased. <laughs> and of course, a lot of hard and smart work goes into that making that small, simple reality um, in, 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 into action. Um, some of this work, including marketing, including brand building, quality assurance, is done by the Coca-Cola company uh, based in Atlanta that I, I have been an employee of uh, for the most part of uh, 40 years. I also was a bottler for a while. A uh, lot of the other important work um, is done by our 250 bottling partners uh, that make up, um, uh, that, that, that actually manufacture um, uh, the products, uh, package them, distribute them, uh, sell them. Uh, those are essentially uh, that whole supply chain. Um, and speaking of, uh, of course, bottling partners, you, um, Troy Taylor was already introduced to you. I'm, I'm really delighted to be with him today. Um, is a great industry leader, Troy, uh, and one of the key reasons uh, why our business right now is flourishing in the Sunshine State. Uh, Troy Taylor. Let's give him another hand. <laughs> Globally, um, every week we serve uh, 24 million retailers around the world in 207 nations. So at least once a week, our trucks, those red trucks that I started my career on, will stop at one of those 24 million retailers, sometimes twice a week, but at least once a week. Um, and those, uh, we have more than, more red trucks than UPS, Federal Express and DHL put together, serving those, serving those uh, 24 million retailers around the world. Um, and when it comes to marketing, today's consumers do not anymore want to hear a, what used to be the way we do business, which is a brand monologue. That's how we used to do business. They actually want to have an engaging discussion in a dialogue about our brands. So that's another, that's been another big shift. So that shift has made consumer expressions, often via social media, much more important and valuable and critical than traditional consumer impressions. 
In the old days, what we used to do is make good products. It wasn't that complicated because we had only a few brands. Um, we would distribute them, make them uh, available at an arm's reach of desire, create good consumer pull through Im consumer impressions, good advertising, and that's essentially where it all ended. Today, no longer. Consumers actually want a dialogue. Um, they want, they, w the way we can only be successful now is creating positive consumer expressions, i.e. consumers have to talk positively about your brands and products for you to be successful nowadays as opposed to you talking about, uh, about your product. So that's been a big, big shift. As we see it, as I have always seen it throughout my 41 years, um, a brand uh, is a promise and a good brand is actually a promise kept. So as brand custodians, we always have to keep our brand promises while continuing to invest strongly and smartly in those brands. And in recent years, you may have noticed that some other consumer packaged good co goods companies have struggled a little bit to keep their established brands relevant and desirable. Um, you s hear about it more and more. Uh, we're also seeing a growing link between brand love and business respect that comes into this equation very much. Um, so a lot of shifts here. Uh, and so Coca-Cola um, has always tried to make a very lasting and positive uh, difference in the world. Uh, as, and we know we can't have a, we all very much know we cannot have a positive and thriving uh, business, a growing business, unless we're serving thriving and growing and strong uh, communities around the world. So one of our tasks has have always been, how can we strengthen uh, communities? Uh, but also more than that, when I, um, during my tenure as chairman and, and CEO, we've always focused on running our business not only for the next quarter, but for the next quarter of a century at the same time, <laughs> simultaneously. Quarter of a cen century, but also the next quarter. But not only one. Uh, and and the w we have focused on what I have always referred to, um, and my successors I know will continue that, um, have always been creating a long-term stakeholder value for a group of stakeholders, starting with your employees, consumers, customers, partners, many kinds of partners, our bottling partners, our NGO partners around the world, our academia partners around the world, group of partners around the world, uh, communities, and even um, the 207 governments that host us around the world by paying by being one of the biggest tax collectors for those governments. Um, when we create long-term value for those stakeholders that I just mentioned, is when we optimize value for our shareholders. That's, our mo that's been our model. And seven, eight years ago when I first talked about that, um, investors weren't that happy. How come we're not at the front? You are at the front, but you can only stay at the front if we do it like I've just mentioned. Create long-term value for stakeholders so that we can, on a long-term basis, optimize value for you. Uh, and during my tenure, we have optimized value for them. We have created $95 billion, returned $95 billion um, over the last decade in just uh, sh uh, share buybacks and dividends and created about $80 billion of, of uh, cap market cap increase. Um, but at the same time, the company is much stronger because we run it for not just for the next quarter, but the next quarter of a century, much stronger foundation for the next increment of, of stakeholder and shareholder value. As we work to create uh, more value for every community we proudly serve, our guideposts have been, my guideposts were the three W's, 
uh, water, women, and well-being. And then we've now recently added another a W, which is a world without waste. So now we have four W's um, in terms of how our, our what is what is our guideposts. Um, with women, um, it started first internally. Uh, when I first became um, CEO, um, I looked at who was buying the products of the Coca-Cola company. Who, who are the shoppers? The answer came back as 68% women were shoppers, gatekeepers. They were the ones who were purchasing. Then I said, let's look at the numbers for women executives in the company. It was 17%. So I said, there's a big, big um, dichotomy here. And we went to work, created a Women's Leadership Council with the sole purpose of generating a much healthier pipeline and promoting, um, uh, uh, retain, retaining, mentoring, promoting, and retaining uh, women executives. And nowadays we have about, um, I think, uh, over 40% senior leadership in the company, and the pipeline is at uh, a little bit over 50%, which even bodes better for the future. We had two women directors, now we have five, uh, which is at the very top end of Fortune 50. Um, and no question about that, we, we said that's not enough. We went about creating the largest women empowerment program the world has ever seen, called Five by 20. Uh, we set the goal in 2010 to create ten, uh, 5 million women entrepreneurs by 2020 um, outside of the four walls of the Coca-Cola company. Very simple. Every country, we have an NGO partner that identifies the women. We have a very basic curriculum uh, teaching them basic finance, hygiene, stock rotation, logistics, distribution, supply chain, and retailing. Mobile buses, um, other uh, forms of, of, of training programs. We, once they graduate, we link them up with the IFC microcredit. Uh, IFC and I did two deals, each $100 million each. First tranche, $100 million. Second tranche, $100 million of microcredit. And now uh, we have 3.4 million women already and we will get to 5 million by 2020, which is the largest program undertaken by a commercial enterprise for women uh, empowerment. Why? All communities in the world that have this program get stronger. Women, hire more women, educate their children, um, and once that happens, communities get stronger and better. And then I stand up at the shareholders meeting, even this year, my last one, and somebody asked me a question, well, how do you justify all this? Well, first, it's not my money. IFC has given me the microcredit. Yes, I spend a lot of, we spend a lot of time as an organization, but guess what? Most of those women entrepreneurs become retailers, distributors, and they will sell many other products. They will sell Vodafone um, uh, cell cards. They will sell confectionery. They will send, uh, sell other beverages, but they will have a loyalty to who put them into business. And so that's my payback. Uh, in addition to my brand getting stronger and better and respect for my uh, company getting better and stronger. Um, so then um, in water, in again 2010, we put out a goal that says by 2020 we'll become water neutral. People looked at us as if we just came from Mars. Water neutral, what does that mean? What that means is that we use roughly, at that time, we were using 300 uh, billion liters of water a year for making our products and for, uh, for our production systems. And we said we would give that back. And they said, give that back? How are you going to give that back, 300 billion? Well, now it's a half a trillion liters, actually, because the business has grown so much. And we now have achieved that goal five years ahead of schedule in 2015, and we are now water positive, no more neutral. We're actually three R's, re reduction through technology in, in our 1,004 factories in 207 nations, recycling. Before, we used to just put the water that was used 
back into the sewage system. Now we have fish ponds. We put it through the fish pond. The fish are still swimming, and then it goes into the uh, clean water system because we recycle the water. And then the two are not enough. We reclaim. We have thousands of reclamation projects that uh, capture water from running into the oceans uh, and give back to the communities. And for the third W, uh, our um, uh, business contributes to the well-being of families, communities. We're one of the uh, largest private employers in the world. We employ 770,000 people as a system in um, 207 nations. Um, our multiplier effect based on many uh, educational programs that have done studies in many universities have done studies is 10 to 1. That means for every job we create, there's about 10 jobs created in, in every country because of the multiplier effect, packages, package suppliers, advertising suppliers, label suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, we have helped medicine with the Bill and Milling, the Gates Foundation uh, go to the last mile in Africa, saving uh, thousands, hundreds and thousands of lives because the, 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 uh, in many, 12 African countries, they found out that uh, the medicine was not getting to the last end of the arteries. Um, and through using our supply chain system, uh, we were able to get medicine, improve the availability of med medicine in 12 African countries, started with Tanzania and went to 12 African countries by 30%. Um, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called the Last Mile Program. Uh, installing clean water kiosks um, in underserved communities. And then also very much committed uh, to being part of the solution to the very, very real challenge of obesity um, with uh, more no uh, uh, and low calorie beverages than, than any other um, consumer goods company. Um, and products than any other consumer goods company. Um, more now smaller packs than any other consumer goods company, um, downsizing packs, uh, intensifying innovation in sweeteners um, uh, uh, with less added sugar. Um, and so that too, um, and we're very much committed to uh, increasing uh, our availability of low and no cal uh, um, uh, calorie beverages. Last year alone, 400 new products were introduced, taking the total number to 800 now products in our portfolio uh, for low and no calorie beverages. What we're seeing also today is a huge shift from mass marketing to mass personalization. That's what's happening in the consumer goods business. And Share a Coke, uh, which replaces our brand name with names of individuals, um, is a great example of this. Um, another is Coca-Cola Freestyle. The futuristic fountain um, now offers more than 200 uh, drinks. Our legacy fountain equipment used to offer six drinks. So if you went to any food service restaurant, you'd have a legacy equipment that had six drinks. Now Freestyle would offer you, will offer you 200 drinks and able give you the ability to create your own personal mixes. Uh, using technology um, to, uh, to, for so many choices and shareab shareable mixes helps us to create more personal and interactive uh, connections. Um, so the truth is, at this point um, in my life, I have, uh, having spent 41 years, I've never been more optimistic about uh, the future of uh, my business. Um, we have a strong and diverse portfolio getting stronger. We're res reshaping our product mix. We have now a very aligned and, and growing bottling system. Um, we have strong, a very strong leadership team um, under my successor, Chairman and CEO James Quincy. Um, and in addition, just I'll offer you one last point here. There are about two billion households in the world. Pretty much that's the number. If you check, it'll, some figures will say 2.1, some will say 1.9. There's about 2 billion households in the world. Each day, each day, each of those 2 billion households consumes 26 drinks every single day, 26 servings of drinks. And we supply 
about two of those right now with our 3,800 products, which is one reason why we see limitless uh, growth opportunities. Um, when I say 26 drinks, it includes every kind, hot beverages, cold beverages, alcoholic beverages, tap water, everything. And that's why I often get the question, are you going to get involved and invest in any other consumer um, um, product uh, categories? I say, never, no, because look at the opportunity. Two out of 26. Look at the limit. So I'll end um, uh, the discourse on, on the business there. Um, um, a few thoughts as I, as I finish on what I consider 21st century uh, leadership, business leadership. Um, and certainly everyone here is uh, very well equipped um, uh, as, as uh, this, uh, being connected to such a great school as University of Miami. I, I hope, uh, uh, I know that you, you learn almost everything here as you prepare for what's next, but I'll offer you just a few thoughts. Number one, in my view, tomorrow's business leaders have to have a global world view and the ability, the distinct ability to be able to navigate uh, people, diverse people, diverse places, diverse cultures and languages that come with that. In other words, you need to be as comfortable as living in Miami as you do in Mumbai. Critical. Second, uh, tomorrow's uh, business leaders must be master relationship builders, master listeners who treat everyone, bar none, with dignity, respect as though they are going to meet them again. This is again, to me, a, an absolute must have. Um, and the most successful will be those uh, that are able to build vibrant, vibrant relationships across what I call the golden triangle. The golden triangle of business, government, and civil society. Because none of those three alone can solve the big societal problems of the world today. None of them. Government for sure can't. Um, business can't. Civil society can't. And when I say government, I mean every level of government. And I have a lot more trust in, in sub-national government than I do in national uh, government. Sub-national means cities. To me, if you take the one time I re re remember, um, year after year, we used to go to Davos, and I used to be the chair of the International Business Council at Davos for many years, and I was uh, the vice chair of the foundation of the World Economic Forum. And one day, one year, I said, look, every year we get here, we make promises, everybody gets on a, their planes and goes, and everybody comes back at this, in one year time and opens the same page and no one ever checks what happened to those promises and what happened since we last met. And I said, one year, let's get the mayors of the top 20 cities into one room, 20 CEOs, 20 civil society leaders, and make some commitments about youth unemployment. That was the subject, youth unemployment. And let's not start again from a white page. Let's track it and then start from the next um, where we left off. And that was the one considered to be one of the most successful meetings ever had in, in the World Economic Forum. And it went on for many, many years, even after I had uh, passed on the torch of the chairmanship of the International Business Council. And that's why I have tremendous um, uh, respect and, and, and I, I have tremendous belief in subnational government because mayors uh, of small, medium, large towns actually speak less, do more, as opposed to the opposite with national leaders. Um, third, um, you need to remain 
entrepreneurial, uh, with a strong respect for cash. I always say to young, uh, to, uh, young, young uh, the youth when I go to institutions like this one, keep some cash on you. Um, because money, um, never let money become an abstraction. Uh, I have a belief uh, that part of the reason why the 2009 crisis happened is because money became an abstraction. Um, people were buying second mortgages, third mortgages, fourth mortgages. They never had, in, they never knew what was happening behind the scenes to money. Uh, just signing away because uh, you know they, they, they thought it, it was just keep going to keep going up. Uh, mortgage, uh, take, a, take a second mortgage on the first apartment, take another mortgage on the second apartment, and just keep rolling it, and then the whole thing collapsed. Um, today, and, and once or twice, um, I did this. Um, when we had a management meeting, I asked our treasurer to go to the bank, uh, get a bag full of $10,000 of cash, and bring it to the management meeting, and turn it upside down and put it on a table and said, wouldn't it be nice for us to be able to turn Coca-Cola into only cash for a month? So that, you know, salaries are paid in cash, plane tickets are paid in cash, we pay the electricity in cash. We, we lose track. Everything is abstract. Um, and we lose respect. We can never allow ourselves to lose respect for cash. That's the th third thing. Um, Fourth, get, get outside more. Get outside of your office, your city, your industry. Because I have always learned something when I go outside. And there hasn't been one week that has passed in 41 years when I have not visited a store. Not one week that has passed since I, in 41 years that I did not visit a store. I did not take, now in the last 10 years, take pictures with my phone and send them um, to my bottling friends and to my colleagues. Uh, but also, um, I learned something from a consumer visiting that same store, from the customer that is, owns the store or manages the store, from the competitors that are there in the store with me, the pricing, the packaging, architecture, the way the displays are done, uh, what's happening to other products, other categories, um, beer, alcoholic beverages, confectionery, household products. I always learn something new. And last, um, tomorrow is going to definitely not belong to the cynics, but to the cautious optimists. Not optimists, but cautious optimists. Um, you, def you know, after all, if you're going to get up every day um, uh, to make the world better, you have to believe positive change is not only possible, but it's also likely. Um, there's going to be negative news, more than ever before. But if we step back and look at what's happened, it's astounding. Whole new industries have emerged. Global health, global education levels are up. So many Hundreds of millions have joined the global middle class. Uh, urbanization, uh, amazing advancements in agriculture, environmental protection. There's my friend here from, uh, who's also in, um, in the agricultural business and tomatoes. He knows, he can tell you what has happened in the last decade. Um, civil rights uh, for once marginalized people all around the world. Tech technical, biological marvels um, that promise a better future for us all. When I started um, in 1978, everyone in America thought Japan was going to take every single job in America. That was the, and, the, and the, by the way, the interest rates at that time were 18%. You could put your money in the bank uh, and get 18%. So they must have been higher for a business. Um, and everybody was scared to death that Japan was going to take every single job in America. And yes, 40 million jobs in America were lost. But 80 more million jobs were created. Um, is the work done? Is everything perfect? Far from it. But 
the people of goodwill uh, are making a difference every single day and certainly you are all part of it. Um, um, as you earn your MBA, um, an undergraduate business degree, you are all part of it. And so I have tremendous confidence, tremendous confidence as we look into the next decade after 2020. Um, we're on the verge of, I think, great, great things happening. So in every case, I think um, innovation, entrepreneurship, business leadership is going to remain essential. Um, and I know um, all of you are going to help uh, lead the way. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the next part. Thank you. Thank you. until we uh, get the mic uh, down front. Um, thank you so much, Mutar, for a fantastic uh, presentation. Covered a lot of ground. Uh, let's, let, let me go back to uh, the fundamentals of Coca-Cola for a moment. So Coca-Cola for many years has been the, the most uh, valued brand in the world for many, many years. Why is that? Why has Coca-Cola been able to achieve that? Well, I think, um, Don, because I think because w uh, we stand on the shoulders of those that came before us that did um, marvels, uh, and then we've tried to add our piece to that. Um, and um, I believe that people sometimes say to me, um, you know, well, now you're not the undisputed number one brand in the world in, in brand value. There's Google there, and there's, um, there's um, Apple there, and I say, see you in 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. I like it. What's your favorite uh, slogan of all time, your favorite advertising slogan for Coca-Cola? Um, not, there's not one, Coke adds life, um, have a Coke and a smile, all, I love all of those. What about the uh, pause that refreshes? I love all of them. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what does the pause that refreshes mean? Pause that refreshes means just like I did a little a second ago. I uh, just got refreshed with a little pause. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see that it's not going to be an easy 30 <laughs> minutes here with uh, Muta. <laughs> Um, all right, so now, now that you've provoked me, I'm going to ask you a couple of tough questions. Please. Okay. What do you think of uh, jurisdictions, cities, that uh, impose sugar taxes on uh, carbonated beverages? Look, we have nothing against taxes. Uh, we just uh, believe that uh, discriminatory taxes are not good for business, uh, not good for cities, and not good for economies, not good a way to deal with um, something uh, and not a good motivation, it's not a positive motivation. And so um, I think uh, we've always said government, business, civil society, we, business, government, at every level, uh, civil society, whether it's the World Health Organization, CDC, whoever there is in civil society that is relevant there for that time, at that moment, need to come together to create solutions. Um, solutions have to be multiple solutions. Innovation, that it has to come from smaller pack sizes. The way pack, smaller pack sizes happen, I was at Penn Station one day doing a market visit with another fellow bottler, and I saw a lot of uh, tables outside of Penn Station where 20 ounce bottles of our beverages were left uh, with a little bit at the bottom, uh, you know, for uh, say, say, uh, a third of the bottles uh, were still had product in them, but they had been left. And I said to my colleagues, what do you see here? What do we all see right now? What are we looking at? We're looking at something that says to us, 
we need to provide our consumers with more choice, with more smaller packages, because no one pays for something and leaves something um, behind. And so that's, well, that was how mini cans were born, uh, eight ounce bottles were born, six and a half ounce bottles were born. And now you go, to, before you go to the supermarket, what you would see the aisle dominated by what two liter and, and multi-pack cans. Now you see an array of packages, mostly small, and mini, mini cans are growing at, eight, and eight ounce cans are growing at uh, 30, 35% per annum. I think what we had, we were, ourselves, we made the mistake in the 1990s for upsizing too much. Easy way out. And, and now uh, everything is re-architected, the business is growing, much, the, we're at the very high end of, of, of consumer uh, uh, goods uh, um, revenue companies. But coming back to uh, taxes, we are always there to pay our fair share. But discriminatory taxes are bad for jobs, uh, proven time and time after again, and do, do not solve the actual problem that is there, there, they are there for. If you look at, um, the, the, uh, in Mexico, there was a, a tax imposed three years, four years ago, um, and it solved nothing related to the actual um, health side. And the money was basically, um, um, you know, squandered. In, in different programs well, that had nothing to do with what was supposed to go to. Meanwhile, we introduced more than 250 low or no calorie beverages in Mexico, smaller packs in Mexico. They are having a real impact. Let, let's just uh, turn to the, the Butler relationship with Atlanta and then bring in Troy, if we may, after, after you've sure. had a go. Um, why, why is it necessary for a company like Coca-Cola to have a network of independent bottlers? Why, why not control the entire system yourself? Well, what is the value add? The franchise system was created by Coca-Cola 100 years ago um, because Coca-Cola came to the realization at that time before Robert Woodruff, Asa Candler, came to the conclusion that Coca-Cola did not have enough capital to grow the business. Uh, and therefore, um, and the stock markets at that time were very shallow, capital markets were non-existent almost. The franchise system was created. Uh, before anyone else created, the, uh, we, we created the franchise system. We had 1,035 bottlers in the United States at one point in time. And each bottler was given a territory big enough so that the horse cart could go from the factory to the furthest point and come back before dark. <laughs> um, and that then meant um, that many bottlers. And, and I think, you know, I always say this, that um, uh, when metrics for brand America are not where they need to be, Coca-Cola's business never suffers overseas, although we are the quintessential so-called American product. Um, because of our bottlers, because they're so well connected into their communities. And when metrics for brand America go well, we also don't benefit from it. But we're not there to benefit from metrics of a country. We're there to benefit from what we do to s support our brands, invest in our brands, and, and be the best in supply chain. But we are the, it is, th there is no um, business that combines uh, the local essence with the global nature of brands better than uh, this franchise system. That's why it's so powerful. Uh, Troy, how do you see it from the uh, Baltimore side? Well, I'll echo some of the things that Mutar talked about, but I'll go back to one of the things he said in his comments. Could you imagine being the bottler in Miami and the shelf is empty and Mutar is roaming around a store with a camera? <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty scary thing, but the, stores, the store shelves aren't empty in Miami, so I, I think we're in pretty good shape. No, I think Mutar is right. Listen, the, the bottlers serve a very unique proposition in the Coke system, and that is to bring that local Coca-Cola touch to the, cons to the customer, the local consumer, as well as the community. And we do that in a very symbiotic way with the Coca-Cola company. 
But our business is, the Coca-Cola Systems business is uniquely global and local at the same time. And the best way that we figured out to maintain that balance is through, the part, is, is through locally owned bottlers who can invest in communities, be close to customers, be close to consumers, and bring that, that Coca-Cola promise to those communities, customers, and consumers, and do it in a symbiotic relationship, symbiotic way with the Coca-Cola company. The, the beauty of it also is we, you know, we, we rise together as a system, the Coca-Cola company and its bottlers. It, you know, there's no such thing as a Coca-Cola company winning and bottlers losing or bottlers winning and the Coca-Cola company losing. It, it just doesn't happen. And we think we have not only the best beverage formula in the world, we have the best business formula in the world to bring that type of promise together. So I think to summarize, you'd say you can't be a strong global brand without being a strong local brand. Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, you were in investment banking before you... Uh, Don't remind me to all that. <laughs> before you moved into this that's role. A, that's but in I, the mirror now. That's, there we go. I wa wanted to ask you, what, what uh, as a business person, have you learned since you've been associated with Coca-Cola that you didn't learn as an investment banker? And please keep the uh, response as short as possible. Okay. The, 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 the thing that attracted me to want to be a bottler, not only is, is you know, the, the great products that we have, but it's the long-term nature of the business. As Mutar said, we, we you know, bottlers don't even think about the next quarter in terms of reporting financial performance because we don't do that. Most bottlers are around the world are private. But coming from investment banking where you know, you're solely focused on the next deal or the next um, quarter or the next month, that's not what we do in the bottling system. We focus on how do we build the next 25, 50, 100 years. And that's very attractive, particularly if you're going to be a private business person, particularly if you're going to have a family on business. And what better place to do it in a, than in a system where bottlers in this, this franchise system has been around for over 100 years. So that, that's, that's the, the difference and that's, that's what I learned from being in the Coke system, that you have to build a business. Yes, you gotta focus on are you winning day by day every transaction, but are you building a business that will be around for the next 100 years, that will outlive you, that legacy? How are you contributing and building to that? Okay. Let, let, let me just, uh, before we open it up to the audience, a uh, couple of questions um, uh, as we look out to the world, because you said having a global perspective, Mutar, is really important. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, China, how, how is Coke doing in China, and uh, if it's doing well, what are the secrets to doing well in China? Um, it is doing well. Um, I um, was responsible um, 12 years ago for that geography for not just China but Asia. I was running Asia um, in 2005 and 6. Um, and uh, we, China has come a long way since those, day, those days. And our business has come a long way. It's um, a, a very big business. It's growing uh, in a very healthy fashion. And the secret to doing business in China is uh, ensuring that you are able to develop products for the local market, um, for local tastes, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, speed is critical in China uh, more than anywhere else, uh, and at the same time, uh, local uh, partners. Um, so we have two great partners in China, um, Kofco uh, Coca-Cola Beverages, which is um, a large food company that uh, is uh, basically half of the country is in uh, Kofco's hands. Um, they, own, they have about 22 factories. Uh, I was responsible for opening and inaugurating many of those. And then uh, Coca-Cola Swire Beverages, which is another very important um, China, Chinese-based company. Um, uh, originally came out of Britain in the 19, in 1700s. Um, one of the um, trading companies that moved into Hong Kong, but now have significant investments in mainland China. They're the largest real estate business in China today, uh, is our s other partner. And, and the secret is to have good Chinese partners. Uh, and um, we employ um, 44,000 people in China. Um, and um, I believe that it will be um, 
certainly one day, um, not too far along, uh, the biggest business we have. I think uh, I once heard you uh, state in another venue that uh, the number of points of distribution you needed in China to be within an arm's reach of desire was 10 million. Right, now they've uh, the number of retailers in China have gone down to eight, but it's still a big, very big number. Right. Um, how do you manage something like that from a logistics and supply chain point of view? You can't do it all yourself, so you need to have dedicated, motivated, well-structured, well-capitalized distribu private distributors that work with you in addition to your uh, bottling partners. And so our bottlers, each Kafka, and together they would each they would have about um, 4,500 uh, distributors uh, in addition to their own trucks um, that would basically be ex these would are not exclusive distributors but we are able to work on data with them uh, so they are from a data perspective they are basically in our system uh, exclusively in our system. So we would get data also of other products that uh, they are handling. All right. Uh, final question uh, for you and Troy. So when, when you uh, guys got together, uh, what did you, Mutar, see in Troy that uh, prompted you to entrust him with this uh, responsibility? And Troy, what did you see in Mutar that uh, you admired that led you to want to work with him? Well, wh he came, I mean, uh, we had a, n a number of meetings before we crossed the bridge. Um, because um, in the beginning, um, it was kind of, uh, I was very perplexed as to why an investment banker would be interested in getting his hands dirty um, and, and wanting to put his hand under the stone, uh, so to speak, um, when he was a successful investment banker. Uh, but more and more, when we talked, I saw the sparkle in his eyes. Every time we talked about the business, I saw a great sparkle in his eyes and a great motivation that I, t I knew was not um, um, made up. It was genuine. There was a genuine, real, long-term interest to have uh, the Taylor family uh, for generations be um, uh, in this business. And it, it is a multi-generational business. We have, I know, so many bottlers that are third, fourth, even fifth generation um, in, around the world, in s from Spain to South Africa. And I saw that, and, um, um, and in the end, I was very gladly convinced, uh, together with my colleague, Sandy Douglas, who ran Coca-Cola North America at that time, and we shook hands, and and that's, uh, that's all now uh, something in the mirror and he's uh, going from success to success and this is just the beginning. The journey has just began for Troy Taylor and his uh, executives and his family. Thank you, Mutar. Um, Mutar can't, and, and, and he, I've said this before, in his presence and away from his presence. He's one of the, and I've been around a few business leaders um, few political leaders at high levels. Mutar Kent is one of the best strategic business minds that I've ever been around. Um, I even if you go back to how he shepherded the recreation of the Coca-Cola bottling system in not only in North America but around the globe, where he had not only the vision but the courage to pull it off because that, that wasn't easy. He paid $13 billion to take over Coke North America. He, you know, he did the same thing in, in Africa. He did the same thing around the globe with the purpose of refranchising it and putting, in it, putting those assets back in the hands of local owners who would have a multi-generational approach. That, that wasn't an easy thing to do. Con you know, he had to convince the markets. The board. The board. <laughs> and, and the Coca-Cola company has a very strong board. Um, that this was the right thing to do and it wasn't going to be something that had that would happen overnight. So from that standpoint, you know, just being around Mutar, I've learned so much over the years and, and he's been not only a great friend, but he's been a great mentor. And so I enjoy that time with him. The other thing is, it, and, and it came through in his remarks, Mutar is just a great person. 
his commitment to building a better world, community by community, his commitment to women entrepreneurs and what that means to communities, his commitment to having the Coca-Cola brand, the Coca-Cola brands play a critical role in building communities is unseen. It, it's interesting, you know, when, and, and nothing against Larry Fink who runs BlackRock. You know, Larry Fink came out and said, yes, you know, we want to invest in companies at BlackRock that are committed to communities, you know, and all these, and I'm saying, that, you know, the Coca-Cola system, we were doing that 10 years ago. And you know, people are applauding Larry Fink. No, again, nothing wrong with Larry Fink. But he's been doing it for many years, decades. The Coca-Cola system has been doing it for decades, so it's nothing new. So the Coca-Cola system's commitment to building a better world as we do business, and, and Mutar has played a critical role in that, that was very attractive as well. And lastly, and you know, you go to you know any franchise system now, whether it's Coke or McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, you name it. There has been times in the Coke system and in other franchise systems where the leader has not been very respectful of an understanding of the franchise system. That was never an issue with Muto. He's very respectful of it, he understands it, he knows that it is a key formula to growth and prosperity of the Coca-Cola company and of the Coke system. All right, let's, uh, let's open it up. Uh, uh, we have uh, some questions. Um, do we have uh, the mics available? Yeah, okay. Um, so let's take the gentleman with the blue shirt first, okay? If you could come down here. Please, please keep the uh, question brief, single sentence ending with a question mark hey. is appreciated. Yeah. Uh, hi, Motar. Hi. Alex Rodriguez, McDonald's, owner-operator. We served on RMHC Global Board. Yes. Good to see you. Nice to see you again. Um, as your largest customer, and I would say probably your most important customer, uh, McDonald's, can you talk about the relationship with McDonald's and Coca-Cola? Sure. Um, you know, um, thanks for the question. As you know, um, you, you know, um, others may not, it started with a, with a handshake um, between um, uh, the Coca-Cola company and McDonald's, um, Ray Kroc and, and, and and uh, Wadi Pratt at that time in, in Coca-Cola and, and, and it's been going on uh, strong ever since and, and I think um, we, the P, the partner, partnership is the key um, and uh, we, we are proud to serve uh, uh, McDonald's, uh, 13,000 restaurants in the United States and 13,000 restaurants outside of the United States and, and every time um, somebody pulls into a, a McDonald's drive-in or into a McDonald's restaurant and they know that um, uh, they know that partnership uh, between uh, you know great um, food and, 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 and great uh, beverages and so that's been going uh, very well and we have um, also uh, done many innovations together from uh, uh, the children's uh, menu to, to uh, other beverages, uh, hot and cold, uh, including um, coffee. Um, and now we also serve McDonald's uh, coffee uh, in cold, uh, in ca cans um, and, and bottles around um, uh, the United States. And that partnership is going to continue to expand. So, and um, one of the great elements um, is again, uh, what, how McDonald's serves communities through RMHC. Uh, then I, and I have been a proud member of the board of RMHC uh, for over eight years. Um, and that's again, uh, just another way that brand gets stronger as a result of uh, stronger communities. Okay, any other uh, equally tough questions? Um, let's take the gentleman with the white shirt. Um, I am Johnny Marzal, hello Mr. Kent, thank you for being here. Uh, I have a quick question as you as a big, huge leader. What do you think about artificial intelligence? Is Coca-Cola incorporating anything of that? And personally, what do you think about it and how it will affect societies? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a lot written about AI and a lot uh, not written about AI, but um, I think AI I I is, is here to stay. Um, it's not gonna uh, develop as fast as some people say, and it's not gonna be 
insignificant, as some people say. I think AI is going to change our lives uh, as we move forward. Uh, but um, uh, the, the human element is still going to be a very, very important uh, piece of it all. Uh, let's not underestimate that piece. Um, there, uh, I, I do not believe that um, um, vehicles that um, are going to take over the world with no one in them uh, is going to happen like many, some people are writing about. Um, there will be components of that that happen. Um, a lot of you know, certainly I think before that happens, um, we, we need to, uh, th there are millions of factories around the world where humans still drive forklift trucks. Um, before I think we get to the roads, we got to get to th that part of uh, the, the equation first. The opportunities are great. Huge, um, but but you know, the sexy part of it is you know planes flying themselves, cars driven themselves, uh, uh, boats driven themselves. Before that, we've got so so low hanging fruit in the millions and millions of factories. Fair enough. Uh, let's take a couple more. Uh, maybe the gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, yes, you sir. Hold on, hold on, and take the mic, please. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Scott Joseph. I'm the founder of the South Florida Food and Beverage Association. Uh, sometimes we learn by the great things you've done. Can you tell me one of your biggest failures? You've done? I'm an optimistic person, but can you tell me maybe some of your greatest failures, maybe whether it's through acquisitions or just through business in general? Lots. I mean, um, you know, I bought um, a share in a large uh, coffee business uh, called Keurig. Um, I paid um, two billion dollars for that share uh, of Keurig and I wanted to get into see if Keurig can help me get into um, um, into cold beverages because Keurig is a hot beverage platform and technology can get me into cold beverages in homes um, and it, it basically I, I didn't work out um, I did a deal over the weekend here in Florida uh, at that time, over Thanksgiving weekend, and sold uh, my share in Keurig for a profit uh, to another company, um, um, to um, um, a, a, an investor uh, that uh, basically also later bought uh, Dr. Pepper. So now it's called Dr. Pepper Keurig, and it's a public company now. But that taught us so much about the coffee business taught the Coca-Cola company so much about the coffee business that a year ago we approved our new CEO, James Quincy, to spend six billion dollars and go buy Costco. That was, that, that did not succeed. Keurig did not succeed. But that taught us so much that it gave us enough confidence to part with six billion um, a, few, a couple of years later and, and, and buy the uh, uh, Costa coffee business that will become a very big business for us. So you've got, I always say, where there is no risk, there is no reward. You have to, most of the businesses in the world fail. Most of the songs in the world fail. Most of the films in the world fail. We've got to be aware that failure is an integral part of all of us. Most of us in our careers achieve less than we want to achieve. That's the way it, life is, but we got to learn from that. That's the key. Okay, a couple more quick ones. Uh, yeah, let's take the gentleman with the red shirt first. Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, just wait for the mic if you could. Hello, Mr. Ken. Thank you for coming and uh, sharing your experiences with us. My name is Baran Bal. Uh, I'm an undergrad student at the University of Miami. My question is really brief. What's the biggest advice you have ever received about your business life? And last thing is, um, Mr. Ali Koç, the, one of the richest guys in Turkish uh, business sector, he says that uh, I want you to be the new generation leaders. So what's your understanding of new generation leader? I just want to learn. Because I have always received a very abstract definition, just 
want to, to get your opinion. The Thank best you. advice I ever received was from one of my mentors called Don Keough. Uh, he was the president and chief operating officer of the Coca-Cola company. I worked for him in the 1990s um, in Eastern Central Europe. And his advice was always, the best ideas are outside. They're not inside. And that's why I went and formed uh, um, four incubation centers around the world, uh, one in India, one in China, one in Israel, and one in uh, Mexico, where we incubate ideas. Um, and they get big enough, then we bring them into the Coca-Cola company, because if we bring them uh, in before, they get trampled on. Uh, so the best ideas, I mean, th this is a plant bottle. Uh, it's made partially from plants, from uh, sugarcane molass, 100% uh, recyclable. It's not biodegradable yet. We're working on that world without waste. Uh, the th 2030 world without waste. We got to get there, just like we did on water. With, we did on women, uh, in entrepreneurs. Um, this idea came from an incubation center in India, um, and we took it in, and then we we scaled it up. We have many ideas like that. The le on leadership, um, uh, 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 new generation leadership, I've, all the things that I mentioned, you know, um, relationship builders. Um, I always say never eat alone. Never eat alone. Because when you eat alone, you actually waste the opportunity to build a relationship with someone else. The best way you build a relationship is you break bread with them. And... Um, I always, my biggest advice is don't eat alone. You know, you use that opportunity to create relationships. In my time, when I tried to, when I was first in, in my life creating relationships uh, with friends, we had to write letters and put them through the post box. Uh, stick a stamp on them and put them through the post box and then wait uh, three, four, five weeks for the, the reply to come back to see if your friend was in, in, in good shape. It's much easier today, but we don't use it enough. Uh, take the lady who was uh, waving earlier. Yes, ma'am. Wait, wait for the mic if you could. Can you wait for the mic? I'm actually a great partner to the Coca-Cola family in the vending industry. And, and just as a curiosity, are you planning on coming out with waters that are in aluminum cans? To, and have you made any financial deviations on what the impact versus the, the bottles that we have? Yeah, we, we actually do have a bottle of um, bot uh, water in cans. Dasani uh, flavor waters are all in, in cans. Um, many of our waters in Europe are in, in, in slim cans. So we do have uh, also slim cans. And, um, um, you know, just like we have uh, ec the co achieved our commitments well ahead of goals for um, the first three W's, we are going to achieve the one for um, uh, the world without waste too. Whether it's through biodegradable, whether it's through other means, uh, other innovation, but innovation is, is going to be the key part. Uh, but it has to be achieved. Uh, and, you know, when we achieve those kind of things, you know, we, we tell everyone about how we achieve water neutrality. It's open, it should be open to everyone because it's all about making the world a better place for the next generation. It shouldn't be kept, you know, um, as a competitive advantage. These are things that we all have to work with in this industry to help make the world a better place. And the world without waste is exactly the same. When we crack the code, it's going to be cracked. The same code is going to be cracked for plastic uh, bags. The same code is going to be cracked for all ki every kind of plastic, plastic shoes, everything. Uh, because that's how the world has to work. Yeah, I just want to uh, ask you one final question because um, you achieved the water neutrality five years ahead of uh, target. And maybe coming back to uh, Troy, uh, what was the role of the bottlers in facilitating that? It had to be an enormous part of the, uh, the uh, equation. Key. With the, I mean, the factories are owned by the bottlers. The, uh, where it all happened is in the bottling plants. Uh, innovation before we used to use water to uh, rinse our bottles before we put the beverages in to clean them now we use aseptic air uh, so that is a huge reduction um, then we recycle now all the water giving it to the city water supply as opposed to 
putting into the sewage system. And then the third would be the uh, water replenishment, uh, which is uh, creating, uh, capturing the water uh, and creating, um, uh, converting uh, contaminated water into fresh uh, drinking water. I uh, want to thank uh, Troy and Mutar for being with us. Uh, it's been fantastic. Appreciate uh, so thank much you, your commitment to being here tonight. Thank thanks. you. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you.